Um, I always put this up at the end, but sometimes I'm so rushed and you get there and people are gone. So I want to make sure that everybody gets a copy of, of the um, hour. Michigan University and got my PhD in behavior analysis. I studied under Dr. Jack Michael. And um, we're, there's a, we like to say, many of us like to say, we were in, into behavior analysis long before uh, autism was a buzzword. So we studied, you know, I was in grad school in the, in the 80s, studying B.F. Skinner and, and B.F. Skinner's verbal behavior. And it was like really intense and, and conceptual and analytic. It's like, boy, what does this have to do with anything? It's good, but how does this apply? Over the years, we've come to really find out the importance and the importance of behavior analysis. And I like to look past simply autism uh, when we're working with, with, with kids. I, I like to call and think of myself as a behavior analyst first, who, who practices mainly in autism right now. But there's a misnomer. For those that know me, you probably heard me say this 50, 60, 70, 2,000 times. There's a misnomer of what is ABA? And ABA is discrete trial training, it's thought. Sometimes I'll ask people, who's the father of ABA? And sometimes people will raise their hands and say, Ivar Rojas. That's what ABA is, right? So, no, that's just a, a method. Ivar Rojas was a, was a contributor to our field, sir. I'm talking about. Who started behavior analysis, uh, opera conditioning, or behaviors? I mean, and it's um, B.F. Skinner. Um, and so what we're doing here at our centers and in many places across the country, our field, is we're taking these principles of behavior analysis that are applicable to the whole world, um, if we will let it be. We always say better living through behaviorism and, and, and that. Um, and in this case, when we're talking about ABA as it pertains to teaching children with autism, we're talking about using the principles of applied behavior analysis. When I was in grad school, I could choose between uh, five areas to go into at, at Western. One was experimental, and that's where you, you, know, you, you really get down in a group of you know, rats and pigeons and, and people, but you're really down there at the conceptual basis. Um, then there's applied, where you're working with uh, uh, world problems or, or population problems, and that could be your goal might be how do you, you know, how do you keep people from wearing it would be an applied uh, behavior. How do you keep people wear their seatbelts? Uh, domestic violence, um, uh, world hunger, and, and and the whole area of developmental dis disabilities, which you know, um, when I was there, autism wasn't wasn't much of a, a buzzword. Matter of fact. I dug up a paper I wrote in 1988. I dug this up not too long ago. My first line was, autism affects one in 10,000 individuals. And that was in 1988. I remember writing that. And I, I bring that up because that was really the only paper I wrote on autism um, when I was in grad school. It's all behavior analysis. Now everything is, is autism. I kind of like to remind people that it's, the behavior analysis is, is applicable to so many things. And it, and it kind of, you know, one thing was when we're looking at the thought of working with kids three to five, early intervention, two to five or whatever, and the thought is 40 hours a week, ABA, pound them out. You know, I want to show you there's, that's, that's not quite right. There's more to it than that. But what troubles me is, okay, they're six now, they're seven, they're done, too late. We're going to cut off services or ABA doesn't work with, with adults or, or whatever. And you know, I will argue that ABA works with, with everyone, you know, even your cat. Um, dogs, of course, but you know, everything. So the, what, <clears throat> what it is, and, is, and this is a little bit off from, from my topic, but it's, a, but it's important, is the younger kids, if you come in, you know, people always ask, well, what, what's the prognosis? What is the chance that my child is going to be here? And that depends on a number of factors. So when we say early intervention, 
you come in as a, as a two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old, and you have a really good program, and you have enough hours, and you're not really severe, there's a good chance that you could be mainstream. So there's all of these factors. How severe is the case? How severe is the, is the condition? In other words, a physiology. What are we dealing with? How good is the program? How early do you start? Okay. So you get me. What about the kids that are seven? I have kids that come in there seven, eight years old, and three, four years behind. Um, and maybe, maybe the goal isn't to mainstream. But what can we teach those those kids? And even adult, even even older kids. We have a, you know, you have kids that are that are 17, 15, 16. Um, and they have a fair amount of skills, but they're five, six, seven, eight years behind. Uh, would you say that ABA doesn't work on them just because they're, they're, they're never going to be caught up with their peers? And to say, well, he's not going to graduate from high school, so ABA did not work. And I would, I would argue that, that it does. So it becomes a matter of quality of life. And where, where do you see, when you're talking about the older kids, the younger kids, it's a little different. So if you're just looking a few years down the road. But you get into the you know, teenagers or even um, 8, 9, 10, as you start getting up there, you're thinking, what is your life going to be like? Okay. So <clears throat> I'd like to, like to spread the word of behavior analysis. See, this is like church. Um, <laughs> spread the word that, it's, that it's, um, it's more than just sitting down at the table. And one of the things we wanted to do at BACA is do presentations like this um, that are obviously relate to, to autism and what we do behavior analysis. We want to have, we work with um, um, six or seven PhDs from around, around the country, now, most of whom I, many of which I went to Western with um, or know throughout my, my career. Um, and they'll come in and, and do some workshops. I think this is the first one here, right? Yeah, this is, so I'd like to start, I'd like to do, I'm, I'm kicking this off. So about every two or three months, I'd like to have a workshop, a free parent training workshop, uh, a spread the word um, uh, workshop. And um, they, um, probably John and Barbash might do the next one, or, and um, Troy Fry may do one. He works, he specializes in, in some, some uh, older kids and in the um, essentials for living. So anyway, I think I can go back to the beginning now. Training. 
what I really want to get to, what I call natural environment training, is more about skill building. So while behaviors are, are important, that's a whole other workshop. But when I talk about natural environment training, we're talking about teaching our, our, our students, our kids, um, away from the, the intensive teaching setting. Maybe away from the table or, or away. And using the natural environment um, or, or, or functional ways of teaching. So sometimes there's, there's <clears throat> natural environment itself um, could, could, be, could be helped if I also add functional. Think of like functional. Um, we don't say functional teaching so that you can survive in a classroom um, is important. You might not think of that as natural environment, but that's what I like to think about. When I'm talking about natural environment, it's just that in a really broad sense. And I'll, 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 I'll talk about functional skills as well, or, or functional use of skills. So it's uh, one area that parents and teachers find uh, difficult. It, it's, it can be hard to do, but it's critical. Uh, it's sometimes thought also that if a student isn't sitting at a table for 40 hours a week, and I already alluded to this, pounding away, then you're not doing ABA, then you're not teaching. Okay? That's not the case. Really what it boils down to is the quality of the trials. Okay? So um, if, <clears throat> if you are teaching a natural environment, and by the way, letting a kid play all day in the natural environment isn't natural environment teaching. Well, it might be, to, depending on your definition or what your goal is. But what I'm talking about is conducting trials, getting responses, and, and, and getting, getting some teaching done in places that are away from the table. And I'll give many examples of that. Um, and many examples that, that are not. So what is natural environment training? Any place where, uh, say, direct or intensive teaching is, is not taking place. Uh, by the way, the term discrete trial is sort of a misnomer. Direct teaching is probably not the, the best descriptor either because that, that can be done anywhere. A discrete trial, uh, Skinner defined that in 1938 as an you know, antecedent of behavior response. Um, I say, oh, can you hand me that Kleenex? You hand me the Kleenex. I say, thank you. There's a discrete trial right there. So we do discrete trials. We can do discrete trials in the environment. So I, but it's, it's been come to, to be known as uh, um, synonymous with. with um, well, ADA or LOVAS or, or sitting at the table and doing a discreet trial program. But I just want to let you know that, that we are doing trials. We do want to do trials in the natural environment. We want to set up occasions to teach in the natural environment. And we can call those discreet trials. But it's not what we call discreet trial training. And most people in the field now wish the term discreet trial training had never come up. So, because now we, we look back at it and say, that's not really a good descriptor for what we did. Um, the type of training that is called the street trial training at the table is important. Or, or what I would, I, I like to call it more intense, directed teaching. It's important. Natural environment training is important. Okay? You need both. Because in the natural environment, you're not probably not going to get enough trials. You're probably not going to have as much control. So you're going to need to teach some things. So any place where you can use instrumental teaching, uh, activity-based teaching, um, using the natural environment or the natural, the natural activity or setting to teach. I'm talking about you know, having, having lesson plans revolving around activities or even places. So for example, think about, suppose that you're, I'll, I'll give some, some examples of a, of a student in school, and then some examples, just things to think about. I'm not giving teaching examples right yet, but if you think about a student, let's say he's um, in, the, in the seventh, eighth grade at, at, at school, whether it's in special ed or in mainstream, pulling the research report, whatever, he's, he's in the school. Um, how can you teach, where, where are some things that you could do some teaching? Um, outside of, of directly teaching in the classroom. What goes on in the gym, okay? in the cafeteria, and, and the library, the playground? So I can think about all of these places. 
think, okay, in this activity or this area, how can we come up with a lesson plan? What did we teach the child here? Whether it's in the, you know, in the classroom or, or at home or, or whatever, what skills does the child have? And why did we teach these skills? Not so that not so that he can answer, he or she can answer sitting at the table. If we're in school or, or if you're in an ABA program or whatever, if we're, if we're doing the quote street trial training or the training, we want it to go somewhere. We want to be able to use the skills in these places. Okay? Well, also, if we want to use the skills in these places, we've got to teach the skills in these places as well. Okay? So if you think about it, it's like my goal might be I want, I want my son to be able to ride the bus. Okay? Um, well, I can teach all the prerequisites and stuff, but sooner or later, I have to get on that bus and, and, and start doing some training there. Okay? And, and again, there's, very, there's a lot of levels. You know, I might not be able to start there, but eventually I want to get there. So, just, this is the first start. Example, so, so you're just thinking of places and activities. Okay? That's where, where, where I like to start with non-school examples, the kitchen, bedroom, uh, I got a lot of examples in, in here. Backyard, mall, movie theater, bathroom, uh, swimming class, park. Yeah, it goes on and on. Endless places <coughs> that you can teach. Okay. So while it's true that um, trials in the natural environment may not be as intense, and they shouldn't be, the quality of the trials are better. And they're better because they're they're real, or closer to real. Um, they're more thought out. So while you're working with the child at a table, doing intense training, the pace is probably going to be a little bit faster. You're, you've got this, these goals and these objectives that you want to get done um, in the natural environment. It's going to be a little bit more natural. You don't want to go in the natural environment. You don't want to go into the, in the kid's bedroom and say, get the pillow. Good getting pillow. Put it there. Now you don't want to say that at the table anyway. That's what I call my ABA voice, which is you know, I, a, lot of, a lot of times I catch, catch people say, "Hey, what's your ABA voice?" Use a natural tone of voice because who talks like that? Touch nose. Okay? So we want to be able to say, you know, they're kids and they're, they're hey, can you touch your nose? Um, another issue is like, why are we out in the Touch knows another. A similar, I have another workshop on why are we teaching. There's some overlap here. What are we teaching? Okay. So if, when I when I use that example, touch your nose, I want to know why are we why are we teaching that? And and there and there should be a reason. And and one of my the opening lines in, in a presentation I just did in Kalamazoo was um, so you taught your kid how to tap or how to label camel. Is that a good idea? Now what? Okay. So and the, the question is. When was you, you, suppose that you have you have ten or fifteen things that you can that you can label, you know? Should one of them be camel? <laughs> but yet, you know, I see kids that have fifty labels, and I, I've got some terminology in here. And I'm really gonna, I know I got a mixed crowd. I'm gonna try to. You'll see the word tact and man probably. So I'm gonna try to pair that. Tact is simply label. So I see kids. They have. <coughs> 30 tags, 30 things that they can label. 25 are animals and five are food. What are you gonna do with that? <laughs> if you're in a foreign country and you have 15 words, would one of them be camel? <laughs> so that's what we're always thinking. What are, we, what are we going to do with this skill? So when we're selecting skills, what are we going to do with it? And here's where this natural environment training comes in. How are you going to use that? I taught this skill. Can I now take it into the natural environment or away from the table or a more looser, uh, a looser situation? And if you can't, then you have to question, why did I teach that? And that's another, another issue of paying attention to the, to the development of the, of the student. And if you're teaching things that are way, way out of, out of, um, out of sequence, um, they're, they're likely to be roped. Um, so it's the NET, natural environment training by itself, uh, may not be sufficient because the number of, of trials um, 
and the structure may not be there. So both types are, are necessary, intense, direct, natural environment. So if you take advantage, here's the other thing, if you, if you, if you take advantage of, of uh, teaching situations throughout the day, um, outside of the formal setting, uh, you can teach many skills without having to set up a separate time. That's what I tell parents, you know, when you think about, boy, we want this training to go on all day. So, you know, autism is 24 seven. And think about typical, typical three, four year olds. Here's, here's the big one. If, 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 you, if, if we think that we're gonna get a, a three year old who is what we call a level one VB mapper, somebody that can, some, uh, let's say we've got a three year old, even a five year old, whatever, that has 50 labels, can point to 50 things, can match a few things, can imitate a dozen things, maybe about the equivalent of an 18 month, close to two year old, but this gets four or five. You're not going to get a lot done in two, three, four hours a week. Okay? Because look at, the, look at the typical kids, typical three year olds, four year olds, five year olds. You watch them and you say, well, they're not even in school. The three year old, four year old. They may be, but they don't have to be. What about the summer? They're learning all the time. They are learning through natural, just their, their day, their, their observational learning. You know, I've got, a, I've got a, my youngest daughter just turned two. Um, and it's just fun to watch her learning things from her older sisters, just picking things up. We didn't teach it. That doesn't happen very easily with our kids. So we have to teach it, and we have to go that extra mile. We teach it, now we have to put it in. <laughs> we have to set up occasions for it to be used, and that's the natural environment. So you, know, you can say, boy, this is like, should be all day, all the time. Then the question is, boy, how, how can you possibly do that? Well, understand, you can't do intense teaching all the time. But what I'm talking about from the, for, for parents is, if you can learn how to not spend more time working with your child, but just simply how you interact in some of these tips and some of these things I'm going to talk about today. When I go into a home, sometimes I might, I might watch, I might watch dinner, and I might watch a, a, a parent you know, getting the table ready and pouring ketchup and all of that and, and fries. And I might say, what would happen if you put the ketchup right there? First thing I say, well, I'd throw a tantrum or reach for it. I say, well, let's see if we can get him to ask for the ketchup. And, or I might say, you know what? You're doing too many things. Let's see if you can step back a little bit and use teaching moments out of the, the dinner time or the bath time or, or, or whatever teach those things. And at first, like I said, it's hard, but if you practice it, look at these examples, um, you're going to get better, and, you, and you're just going to naturally, naturally um, take advantage of those situations. And you're going to have to create, you're going to create situations as well. Um, you know, just little things like the time that you spend, just think of, and, and this one I'm going to kind of build with examples. You're out playing, you're, going to, you're, you're giving your kid a wagon ride around the block. You're out playing ball in the backyard. Is there anything you can work on while you're doing that that you can work into that activity? Okay. And that's what this is, this is all about. Um, oops, what was my lead into this? Uh, ah, you can significantly increase the number of uh, daily number of meaningful learning opportunities. Now, what is a meaningful learning opportunity? This is a big pet peeve of mine. It's like, it's, oh, we teach all day, or we, you know, it's the meaningful learning opportunities. I see a lot of kids that they may be my clients. They might go into, um, let's say, a, uh, they, they may be in the classroom. Maybe they're in the wrong classroom. They're functioning at about a two-year level three, maybe, and they're sitting in circle time, and they're not able to answer any of the questions but they can sit there for, for a long time. Okay? And, and maybe that's good for the other kids, but this particular kid I'm looking at, in this example, isn't able to answer any of the questions and is just standing or looking away. But he's sitting there for a half hour. I'm gonna say those aren't meaningful learning opportunities. Not for that child. That's great for the other, for the other kids. And that's where, like, when you get into school places, I think a lot of kids are, I, and that's, again, a different workshop 
series number three is, is placement and what the, what the classroom and situation should look like. And, and somehow you have to question, and this is a tough one. What do you do with a 14-year-old with a that's, that's, that's got our first grade language or kindergarten language repertoire? And it's tempting to say, well, let's put them in eighth grade. But what are you going to teach there? Okay? And, and that's, that's tricky and that's, that's hard to explain. We want social stuff and want all that. But I just like people to think about it. What you're teaching right now, you know, in, in front of the class, you're teaching in the class, is your child, I'm pointing at you, Ann, I guess, for, is your child, I won't use a laser pointer, um, <laughs> getting that. Is that a meaningful trial to your child, for your child? And often, the, the answer is, well, there's an instructional aid. And what's the instructional aid doing? Giving the answers or helping the child with these questions. That can never be faded. So then they say the child's prompt dependent. You say, child's not prompt dependent. Well, it might be prompt dependent, but you you know what? I'm prompt dependent. I can dunk a basketball as long as I have a ladder. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want me to dunk a basketball, and you say, you know what? I keep moving that ladder, and he, I keep falling on my butt when, when someone moves the ladder, and they call me prompt dependent. Said, don't I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make I'm not gonna dunk basketball. And so so it's that that matching and, and sometimes it's it's really tough. It's a tough one. I know being a parent, it's like you want so bad for your child to be in that setting with the other kids. And I understand that, I really do. But I think we also have to look at, you know, get beyond and say, where is this child or young adult gonna be in ten years? And what does that child need need to learn? Another thing I think of is like, who are your peers going to be when you're 18, 19? Schools. You're in school for a couple of years. Okay. <clears throat> but back to the meaningful learning opportunity. I like to see, and that's what I do, I, I like to count opportunities, meaningful learning trials, when I'm observing a program. Um, like I say, I might, I might see a program where, where, where people seem to be working really hard, or they say this is a program the kids play it for 45 minutes. I'm going to say, I, I'm not sure what I, what I see. Now, what, the goal is, you know, playing, manipulating objects, okay. But what else are you trying, trying to teach? So that's what I say, a meaningful learning opportunity. And that is, my definition, a chance to practice a skill that's relevant and practical to the, to the student's current situation. Okay, so is it something that... It is, it's something that's in your program or something that's, that is, is relevant to what we're trying to teach. A skill that's in the, in the student's current ability. And the opportunity to prompt, and here's how, how much you define that. The opportunity for a prompt if needed and follow-up chance to try uh, without the prompt. So can you realistically fade the prompt? So if, if I were to say, um, um, you know, tell me a car that starts with an L. Oh, a Lamborghini. Can you say Lamborghini? Good. Okay, now we're going on, you know, to, to the next one. And I never come back. First of all, I probably don't care if you can tell me that, but I, I see that a lot. Uh, you don't know the answer, so I'm going to tell you because everyone else comes in the class or in the group can give, give me the answer. So you can't give me the answer. I'm going to tell you the answer. And then I move on. And so two problems with that is, one, if you're going to bother to ask that question, if it's really important for me uh, that Courtney knows what a Lamborghini is, uh, I'm going to need to work on that a little bit more. I'm going to at least come back. What's the car that starts with an L? Good. You got it. You got it. That which brings me now. But, but that often doesn't happen. Um, now, with, with, with Courtney, that's fair. I might, if, if we come up with a reason, I, I think I could teach her that. And maybe she could work that into the conversation. She probably already knew it. Um, but um, um, my next question would be, you know, why are we teaching that? Is that a fair, is that a fair thing to teach? Um, and if the only reason, if the only way you're going to answer that question, whatever it is, is if I give you the prompt, then it's not going to be very useful. 
a meaningful learning opportunity. Especially important with kids with autism, I covered this earlier, uh, because typical kids, like I said, learn from everyday experiences. They're always learning. Not to say children with autism don't, it's a spectrum, it's a, it's a continuum. Okay? So there are those, obviously, that learn more. The, the more that we can teach them, we want to teach in a way so that the kids will start learning. They will start to generalize and learn how to learn is, is one of the goals. And it's, it's going to be difficult to teach kids to learn how to learn if you only do the training at the table with picture cards. <laughs> um, again, I don't mean to knock picture cards. They have their place, but it, it's, it should be a, a short, temporary place. Um, I don't mean temporary in the sense of you know, one single picture card, one single picture, you, know, you don't have to keep that around for, for life. You may, throughout, as you're learning new things, introduce pictures or magazines or, or things like that. Like that. But um, I see, I've seen kids that they've got the same five or six, they got the ball, the shoe, the cup, um, the spoon, um, and the, the DVD. <laughs> the VCR tape or whatever, um, and it's been in their program for, for three years. I so said, where are we, are we moving beyond this? Okay. So now for my, who, who here has heard my basketball analogy? Okay, bear with me. This is good. <laughs> okay, now this is how, it's, it's, it's the, this kind of, the, the importance of Natural environment training and standard intense discrete trial or, or direct training. So, um, in order to learn how to dribble a basketball or, or a shoot or to do a layup, how you have to practice probably, and first of all, there's got to be someone to teach you. And it should be done in isolation or, or a small group. Versus, and I say in isolation, I mean versus being thrown into the game. Okay? I've got a seventh grader who's never played basketball. What's the best way to get him started? Well, throw him into the varsity team. Let him, <laughs> let him get beat up a little bit. Okay? Now, when I get to my correlation, my correlate with the, with the kids with autism, you see that happens. I see that happen a lot. Not in basketball, but in, uh, in other things. But I kind of like to, to lay this out clean. So, there's an example. You've got to learn how to shoot a basket, make a pass. You have to learn how to dribble by, um, while running. There's all of these things that you have to be able to do if you're going to survive at that next level. And what's that next level? It doesn't have to be playing five on five with the Park City. In this example, it is. But it could be, you know, it could be just playing in a little bit more of a, more of a structure. Um, so. All of these things are going to be harder to learn in a game situation. Many, many trials. I, I remember I used to watch, uh, oh, years ago, about 30 years ago, I, I had this girlfriend that was, was playing softball for, for work. And um, none of these girls had ever played softball. How about I don't get with this? Um, <clears throat> they weren't very good. And um, not that they were good. They could have been men. Anyway, I'm watching this softball, the practicing, and they had, none of them had played softball before. I'm sitting on the bench watching, and this coach is, is batting, and he's hitting the ball to one, and then hitting the ball to the other um, for about a half hour. And um, so each person gets a chance to feel the ball about once every five minutes for a half hour. And then they went to batting. So each person got to bat about three or four times. Anyway, I'm just watching this. And I'm thinking, this is a, you're not going to learn. You're not going to get better that way. Uh, because you don't have this, you, you have to learn. You know, how are you going to get to be a better batter? You're going to have to practice. You, and, you, and you're going to have to break it down. And you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to do a lot of these little steps. And how do you catch a ball? At least start by playing catch. That would be a prerequisite before you put someone out in the field that, that can't, can't catch at all. The point is, you've got to start there. Oh, and then I went to the games. That was great. We're here with the mercy rule. <laughs> um, but so all of this is going to be harder to learn in a game situation. Many, 
many trials are needed. So as you learn these skills, um, you must be able to put them in a game or a skirmish situation. So now that's, that's kind of looking at the other side of the coin. One, how do you teach them? It's going to be hard to teach them in a certain setting. You're going to need to teach the skills. Two, once you taught the skills, what are you going to do with them? Okay? So you don't see many people that learn how to play basketball. Well, I suppose you could. I mean, generally when you learn how to shoot, when you're learning how to dribble, there's an intent of playing in a game. Okay? So there's a point to that. It's like, I can dribble this basketball. What are you going to do with that? And this isn't quite the perfect analogy because you can do use basketball for recreation. You know, you can just shoot by yourself, and, and that's fine. But I'm looking at this as like your goal is to is to play in a in a game. So if you're on a team, perhaps they're going to be divided into into drills. Um, learn the basics, um, more complex group trials, and then scrimmages, and then the real game. So you're going to be your practice are going to sort of be divided. Depending on the, on the level, you know, if you're, if you're working with seventh graders that have never played, fifth graders, or even with um, with adults or in varsity, you're gonna you're gonna practice. By the time you're in varsity, you already know how to drill. But at some point in that process, you're gonna teach how to drill. You're gonna teach how to shoot. And you must start putting them together. Dribble while you're walking. Dribble, stop, shoot. Dribble, pass. Play a little two on two. Play a little defense, and then you work up to a scrimmage. And then the game. Now the scrimmage is 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 nice. It's, it, we're, now we're kind of getting in the natural environment area. Scrimmage, you can stop. Scrimmage, the difference between scrimmage and the game. Scrimmage, you can stop all the action and say, wait a minute, let's try this again. Let's set this up. Now this time, okay, in a game you can't do that. So let's say if I'm watching in a classroom, I would call that the game. If I'm just an observer. Because I can't come in and interrupt. And I see the teacher ask my child a question, and my child doesn't answer the child that I'm, that I'm there observing. I can't stop the action and say, wait, can you try it again? Can you give it two more chances? And this time have this person. Okay? Um, but the game's still valuable because I can, I can look at this and say, OK, I see what you need to work on. And we're going to take that back to the practice field. Okay. Um, Okay, so the coach would not expect a player to do well in a game if that second step is missing. And that second step, you know, you look at like, like trans, um, um, transitions from, from an ABA program, for example, into a classroom, often that, or to a school or anywhere else, that second step is often missing. And that is, you know, there's, there's, there, there's a continuum of progress that, that should be made. You wouldn't teach someone to drool and how to shoot a free throw, and then put them in the game. All of those second steps are, are missing. And, and so, for example, I'm, we may teach a skill to a child, one-on-one, -on -one. I've, I've got his attention, I've got the reinforcement right here, I've got it broken down, I can get that. You know, he can tell me all of these, answer these questions, you know, where do you sleep? Uh, you sleep in a bed, you brush the toothbrush, you bounce a ball, and, and all of those. Um, I've got it. But now, in a classroom of 20, with one teacher, he can't do it. Well, I'm not surprised. But I often see those jumps. And sometimes it's, it's, I see jumps that are not quite as big, but small groups. So we're going to do this, now I'm going to do a group of two, now you go to a group of 20. That's still too big of a jump. There's, there's that, the, the point is, we've got to be working on that middle. I mean, thinking of, thinking of those, um, that middle um, skill area. So again, the players are, are taught to put all these things together. They're taught isolation, put them together, um, play a little defense, work as a team. Um, and finally, putting everything together. So you wouldn't expect a team that's never scrimmaged. Uh, or playing a game to do well in a game situation. So that's all like, if we teach this child these skills and then just uh, put him or her out in the, in the real world and wonder why it didn't generalize. Okay? We've got to 
And that's where I said that that middle step is often often missing. I've got a good got a couple of videos that will show that or, um, that middle step. Um, so the skirmish game situations, when you're doing a little bit less direct manipulating, uh, they're valuable in that. Well, with the scrimmage, you can you can stop things and 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 set things up, and in a game, you get that feedback. Um, so summary of four parts, uh, uh, basic drills, uh, shooting, layups, wind sprints, uh, that next level, complex, like dribbling then passing to the open man, dribbling while being defended, putting those things together, scrimmage the third, and game the fourth. Okay, so those are, are, are how I kind of see those, those, those four steps. Now, let's look at the teaching language. If you see me, sometimes I'll, I'll blow through a slide because I already talked about it. Um, sometimes I talked about it to death, um, so I'll, I'll skip that. Um, so teaching language for us, basic drills, like the dribbling and the, and the shooting. Uh, much of the curriculum that we need to teach directly, imitation, like matching a sample, uh, listener responding, uh, coax, mans, uh, or, or asking, that's the, the basic Almost like the, the basic elements of, in this case, language or, or any type of teaching, non-language uh, skills as well. But teaching those basics. Okay. And then there's that next step, complex drills. Okay. Putting some function into the basic units. Okay. For example, um, manning or requesting in the natural environment. If I can sit here and hold up a cookie now, how do I teach a, a child? He's first got, you know, I'm teaching a, a signing child. I'm going to hold up a cookie and I'm going to prompt with the cookie and, and I'm going to give him a little piece of a cookie. And let's say we've got that and the child needs to see the cookie and now I've got, I hold up a, a DVD of the child signs movie and I hold up a ball and the child signs ball if he wants it or candy or any of those. Now I've got those because I've gathered these and I did my reinforcer assessment and, and all that. That's good. Well, what are you going to do next? Okay. Let's make that. Let's get some. Let's make some of those situations real. Okay. When the child actually needs something and the object isn't in sight, um, fading that. That would be an example of a, of a more complex drill. Um, labeling and receptively identifying items in the natural environment. Okay. That's you know, if, if you can. You, know, you can again those picture cards. You, know, you can label. All of those, uh, uh, all 750 of them, but you can't identify anything in the natural environment. That's that's not good. So it's so one of the things it's like getting up there. Well, let's talk about and teach, you know, things in the in the natural environment. Uh, demonstrating features, uh, functions of items that have been taught. Um, you know, a, a car has wheels. Um, Car goes fast. Uh, uh, you drink from a cup. A ball you can bounce. It's round. Things about so. In other words, I taught you. About, I taught you a car. Now, why? Um, what are you going to do with that? What do you need to know about a car? And why am I teaching you about a shoe? What do you need to know about a shoe for that to be functional? Um, so, for example, you know, here's a car. Let's talk about wheels. Uh, an umbrella. Let's say you. you there's, Again, I'm teaching you to label umbrella. What am I going to do with that? Okay. And, and you'll see later on some of the examples. Ultimately, I want to I want to get some use out of that. <clears throat> so at least you know, what do you do with an umbrella? And at, at, at the, you can't start teaching too much at one time. You know, let's say I've got an umbrella in the kids program, and I teach the child to touch the umbrella and label the umbrella. I say, what's this umbrella? and the kid has maybe 40 or 50 of those, I, I don't want to teach you know, everything you could possibly know about an umbrella yet. That's a little bit too much. But I might start with open. I might say something about rain. I might demonstrate with the umbrella. What's an umbrella for? And, and maybe, if you, maybe you can't talk about it yet because you don't have the language. Your language is at the level where you can say umbrella, or you sign it, or you say umbrella, or, or open, or, or something some sort of um, approximation. Um, here's a ball. 
You can, you can label ball, you can touch the ball. How about bouncing? What, what are we going to teach about a ball? I might start with bounce, then you can throw. Um, maybe at some point round. I want to teach all of those things. You have things that are going to be easy to, uh, well to teach in the natural environment. You got a cop, but what do you do with a cop? So it's just very simple. Things that we're teaching, just a feature, a function, you know, what? And that's not the end all, but that's just one step. So we're teaching nouns, pictures, or objects. Where are we going next? Let's start teaching things about those items. Now, the scrimmage, contrived trials in the natural environment. So now it's like, now I've got enough language, I want to start setting up situations in the natural environment to allow for practice. And here's where my example start. So here's an example of man eating in the, in the natural environment or asking, um, giving a student jelly for his toast but no knife. Okay? Now of course, now, now think about this, what prerequisites? What does the kid have to know here? He has to know, uh, give the student jelly for his toast. I'm still doing that. Give the student <laughs> jelly for his toast uh, but no knife. Um, it's late. <laughs> start off with a Four hour drive um, What's the kid need to know? What's the student need to know for this to work? What jelly is? Okay. Does not necessarily need to know? And here's where. Well, that was. What does? What really? For this, and this is a pretty simple one. Giving the student jelly, and you think about there's a lot of words there. Give the student jelly for his toast, but no knife, okay? So first of all, there's got to be, the first thing you look at is, it's got to be motivation. So jelly, and, and because sometimes I'll give these examples, and somebody always raises their hand and says, oh, well, my kid doesn't like hot dogs. I say, well, don't teach that. <laughs> That's just an example. But <clears throat> that is important. It's like you have to start there. If you're going to get the child, you always have to think about motivation first. Okay, so really what you need here is at least a behavior change. The child has to, in this example, know how to spread the jelly. So in the case of like knows what jelly is, okay, here's the toast, you're spreading the jelly, and all of that. Because really what all I'm asking for is can you say knife in, in, in this case? And he doesn't have to, to know any, any of that yet. But if you can say knife and spread your own jelly, and if, if you can't, then there's other examples. But I just want this child to be able to ask for a knife uh, when he needs it or, or, or when she needs it. So how, how am I to do that? I'll say, all right, here's your, here's make your, your spreading your, your jelly or whatever, butter, peanut butter, or anything. You got your toast, you got it, you're spreading. And now I'm going to set it up so that there's no knife. And if you're going through this chain, here's the toast, making the toast. Now I've got the jelly. Okay. Right then, right there, I'm going to start teaching by saying, assuming that the child is, let's say, a caller, or, or you could sign, but in this case, say the child will repeat what you say. At that point, I'm going to say, hey, what do you need? Knife. And then hand it to same thing, I might say something like, hey, can you <clears throat> draw me a circle? If the kid can't draw, maybe even just write. If the kid can write, write your name, something. Here's a pencil, write your name on this paper, and now, and, and of course, what's the motivation for that? There has to be some motivation for writing your name or for drawing. That could be anything. Either the kid likes to write, um, or that's something you're asking them to do to get on to the next thing, or to get the token the M&M, or whatever it is. Now, I suppose you hand the child a uh, piece of paper and say, hey, can you, you know, write your name or, or make a mark on that paper? Or, oh, you want a cookie? Okay, can you make a mark on that paper for me? What's he need? Okay. So well, what would you do if, if I told you right now, you, we're out in the hallway, and I tell you this fascinating website that, that really interests you. What's the first thing you're going to reach for? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't given this example for 30 years. <laughs> you don't have your phone. Okay, so now, and, and, and the point is like, how can I make a pencil valuable? Well, 
or how can I make, you know, anything. How can you make it valuable? Um, who here wants a pack of sugar right now? Anybody need a towel? No, they're not valuable right now. What if you just came out of the shop? A towel would be valuable. Um, what if you, you know, you're, you order, you know, somebody hands you some black coffee. You're in a restaurant, you order coffee, and you want cream and sugar. And there's none at the table. What now has become valuable? And what do you do? You start looking for it. So, so that's what, arranging conditions, and we call this contriving motivation. So if I can set up things, and that's back my very first hint at this was, you know, you know that the child wants ketchup on his fries. Why not teach him to ask for ketchup? Um, give me the child. Uh, you can go get a drink from the from the from the sink, but the footstool is missing. Um, just setting up things. That, there's something missing um, in, in all of these examples, um, and, and some of these are not, these aren't just requesting, but there, there are other things as well. Asking a child to go to the bedroom and get a pillow off her bed. Um, now, now, why would that be scrimmage? That could be discreet trials. Okay, Mary, go get a pillow. Now, of course, I'm, when I'm using that voice, I'm exaggerating. It's even at the table, I don't want to use that voice. But, how do you turn, or, 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 or let's say we're at the table, and I'm saying, show me the pillow. Good, that's a pillow. What, what am I going to do with that? That, that's, that's more of, a, of a, the, the basic teaching, the basic drills. But suppose now we're somewhere, you know, maybe we're in the living room or something, we're going to watch TV, and, and you say, well, hey, why don't you lay down here and, and there's no pillow on the, on the couch. So put your head down on the pillow. Oh, you know what? There's a pillow in the bedroom. Can you go get it? And then the child goes and gets, gets a pillow. Now, that, like I said, that one example, I mean, yeah, so what? I don't have to get a good But the point is to start thinking. This, this way. How, it's about manipulating your environment, your, your, whether it's all those examples I gave earlier on. Um, what can you teach in this, in this setting? And so there's many, many examples. Ask a student to open a window. Here's some that are here. And it's, hey, can you open the window for me? It's locked. Now what's, you know, what's, what's valuable now? Any, you know, help or open or, or I'm going to come and get you or, or you know, you can, you can do social stuff with this too. Oh, you need the key to open that. Maybe not a window, but you need a key to open that, or you need some tool to open that. I don't have it. You know who has it? I think Johnny has it. Now the child's got to go over to Johnny. Now there's a social. So that's another, you know, how do you get social behavior? You've got to make it important. You say, well, the kid doesn't like to tell, you know, talk to other kids. Just wants to be left alone. Okay, but how can we make it important? And by the way, some kids, you know, as we're looking at the social continuum, um, you don't have to be really, really social to survive. And, and uh, while we, we want to say, boy, we want our kids to have friends, we want them to have conversations, it may not happen with everyone, and the kids may not care. And, but what we do need, and of course we want, to, we want to get that, but if you just have absolutely no interest in talking to people at all, you can still survive pretty well. But you have to have some social behavior. You have to be able to negotiate. You have to be able to, you know, negotiate trades. You have to be able to talk to clerks. You have to be able to, to tell someone there's a problem. You're in the store and, and uh, they're out of laundry detergent or it's not on the shelf. You're going to have to problem solve. So you're going to at least need that much uh, social behavior. And a lot of that, at least, um, can be taught. Um, giving the wrong disk to put in the computer. Just think about this little, almost sabotaging or, or, or creating these situations. Plain dumb, you know, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, you wanted that one. Um, now, there's a fine line between, see, we want to be facilitators. Not, we don't want to be a pain in the butt. There's a fine line sometimes. And, and I, I did this consultation many years ago, and I went, all of these ways to create language opportunities. And I came back a month later really excited and I saw the kid going through the house and the therapist is running in front of the kid slamming doors in his face. 
something. And, and I said, did I tell you to do that? Well, yeah, create, you know, the door shuts. Don't go out of your way to shut the door <laughs> in his face. Literally and metaphorically. And so it's like, if the door <laughs> is open. So, so, so things like, you know, if you, want a, if you want a child, if you want to practice a child asking for ice cream, um, and you give him a bowl of ice cream and he takes a bite, then you take it away and say ice cream. That's, that could work, but that's odd. Just give him a little bit. You know, try, to, try, try to be natural because you know, they're going to figure it out saying, oh, you put me in a situation where you were, you know. So that's, that's where the thinking and planning comes in. If you mess things up too much, you're going to get a counter control. <coughs> you ever know a kid that uh, <laughs> Just say no. I've had enough. <laughs> um, typical of children with autism. Um, now this one here is like, uh, let's say you're in a classroom. This would require some more language. Um, ask the student to find three items in the classroom that are blue and made out of wood. All right, Eric, here's your goal. I want three items that are blue and made out of wood. And that's a little game. Now go find. And I say classroom. That could be. That could be anywhere. What does a child need to do, <coughs> need to have? Um, at some point, and I'm seeing a program, suppose you've got a program, you're saying, this is wood, this is metal. Is this wood or metal? Show me wood, show me metal. And can you count to three? One, two, three. This is blue, this is red. Yeah, we're teaching those, but why would you use those? And, and this might be an example. Maybe it's a bit contrived, but hey, um, I need you to go to the store and it's down blah blah blah. I need two red tomatoes and a, and a green apple and, and a loaf of bread and, and a jar of mayonnaise. Um, you know, you have to be able to respond like that. But a certain amount of things that the child is going to have to have in his repertoire before you could ask this question. Uh, ask a student to find five items in the classroom that are that are old. Now, of course, that's a, that's tricky. Old is new is rel relative. Um, but you get the idea. Things that you things that you've taught, probably in isolation. How can we use them? Because most of us, we can read something. Yeah, okay, we can read a, a book or some instructions, and then probably figure out later on. You know, I might read. You might read a self help book or something. You pick up some tips or some, you know, dealing with. You know, problem people at work. That's the book that you just got. So you pick up some tips, and now you go there and you say, "Okay, now you're, you're giving you got all these rules." Say, "Okay, now remember, smile." Or you just write Dale Carnegie or something. Like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna smile, and 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna remember your name and, and all all of that. See, you didn't have to be directly taught that necessarily. You can read that, but with our kids, it's it's harder to, to do that. So now some more game, and I'm not asking you to make fine distinctions between game and scrimmage situations. They're kind of similar. It's just you can, you can put those together. Um, asking a child to open the door when your arms are filled with books, and I use this example because um, I remember a, a parent. We worked on all of this, and one day the parent was coming home with groceries, and her kid saw that. And she asked to open the door, didn't think he would do it, and, he, and he, he opened the door for her when she really needed it. So the example of that is that was a real trial. And that wasn't even a trial. That's, that's the ultimate game situation. Something you taught. Child didn't open the door because you said, go open the door. And what's the reinforcer in this case for opening the door? Should be an M&M. &M. <laughs> Um, now, so I, I, I say that, but I mean, it could be. It's like, oh, you know, hey, you know, I, we do that to our kids. It's like, hey, that was a good job. You don't run an extra quarter. But, but the point is, it's not like that trial wasn't about opening the door. I taught you that earlier. Now can you use it? Why else would we teach someone to open a door upon, well, upon command? It's easy to teach kids to open doors. Um, too easy. But <laughs> upon command. Why would we teach it if we're not gonna if we're not gonna use it? Oh, can you go get the hey, you can get the door for your grandmother, okay? You know, things like how are we gonna use that? Because the, the child's not gonna spend the rest of his life sitting at a table pointing at doors that are open versus doors that are closed 
and being able to discriminate those. There's got to be a use, and that's what this is all about. Um, what do you hear? You're outside, you're saying, you know, ooh, what was that? What do you hear? Thunder. Oh, wow. You have to, you have to see the thing of all things. And, and every one of these, I'm giving one example, but you can go up with 50. You know, I would get, we could go outside, and I get about hearing thunder, and I could tie that into rain, and I could tie that into, you know, wet, and thunder is loud, and clouds, I can talk about all of those things that I previously taught somewhere else. And maybe I didn't teach all of those. You can still talk. You know, you've got, and here's one thing, you, I, I get asked this a lot, my child doesn't have the verbal behavior to answer all of those questions. It's a little bit lower. Okay, you can still talk about it, and you can you can tell stories, and you can you can, you can fill in break, um, fill in blanks. You know, like like I, sometimes one of my favorite things walking upstairs. Hey, we're going upstairs. We're going upstairs. Yeah, child's you know may may not be ready to say to, to be able to label up versus down, but maybe I can get in a call. We're going upstairs. Okay? Talking about things over and over, simple things. So you can narrate. You want to be able to ask questions, but you can narrate as well. It's like, wow, what is that thunder? Oh, wow, that's loud. You know, you can say it's loud, even though the child doesn't know loud from soft. Then you might be, then you know, that might give you an idea to, to teach that. Um, okay. Ask the student to look out the window, count all the convertibles in the parking lot. Uh, here's a good one. You know, we do the, we do these little drills like what's missing. I'm going to put you know three things on the table. I'm going to take one away. What's missing? Okay. In the classroom, who's not here today? Can somebody tell me who's not here today? Um, just now, the teacher you know probably knows who's not here today, but you know, who's missing? Who's who usually sits there? Getting it away from the table and 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 practicing, because otherwise, why are we why are we teaching kids to label or to talk about things that are missing? They have to use it somewhere, somehow. It's like my um, my tie is missing, my socks missing, my it's gonna say my cufflinks missing. But at some point, they're probably gonna be at a wedding. Wear um, challenge to see the count the number of girls that are passed on the way to music. Now you're combining things. And you're just kind of thinking of little games that you play to put things together that you, that you talk. Um, look out the window, count all the convertibles in the parking lot, count all the red cars, all the trucks. How about this? Do you think there are more red trucks? Are there more taxi cabs? Or are there more buses out there? Looking at example. Those are things you're going to be at a table teaching little math things. Um, Music room, are there more percussion instruments or, or, or string instruments in the room? Now, the setting doesn't define the type of training. Um, in a sense, it does, but you can go into the natural, it doesn't necessarily. You can go into the natural environment and, and conduct labels and math problems. And I used to see this because I, I preach. Okay, you got to do some natural environment training. And I might come back in a month and I see the therapist sitting out on the playground or in the living room instead of at the table. And touch your nose, do this, clap your hands. What's this? Car? No. <laughs> um, now, that might still be important, but that's not what we call natural environment training. do good trials at the table. So I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that you can't do natural environment type training at the table. Obviously it can't be you can't technically call it natural environment. But now is when I talk about functional. You can do good functional teaching at the table, which is going to be closer to natural environment. The whole goal of this, whether you want to call it natural environment or functional teaching, is you want to teach a skill, a set of skills that can be used and will be used. 
in the in the uh, of environment. So asking a student, for example, you say, "What do you smell with?" I mean, how many times do we see this? What do you smell with? Your nose. What do you hear with? Your ears. What do you see with? Your eyes. What what smell me? What's what's here? So you know, if I, if I ever say like, "Hey, what do you what do you smell with?" Your nose. Okay. Hey, can you smell this? Um, or can you see this? How can you see it? Just kind of like, like let's use those a little bit more. Same with here. Ooh, what's that? What did I just hear? Um, after the students, what's needed in the rain? Hey, what do you need in the rain? Oh, hand her an umbrella. Let's pretend it's raining. Let's get under here. I've actually seen therapists go out and pour water and, and get games, and you'll, you'll see some videos. Because why are we teaching an umbrella? It, it, it's got a function. Well, let's use it. And this, this, this calls for a lot of thought, too. Hopefully, you know, as you get going, you can think of things on the fly, but it's kind of hard at first. But one thing I like to, like to do with our therapists and staff is like, everything that you teach, go through the whole program. Everything that you're teaching, is there something more you can do with that? Is there some way that you can use that? Again, because of these examples, this is why I'd like you to email for the for the PowerPoint because it's there's no way. I, I used to go to workshops and be all fired up, and I'd walk out and say, "What? What was that?" And, and you have to you have to review this. Um, so uh, after asking a question about a ball, what do you bounce? You know, hand the student a ball and bounce this ball. If, I'm, if you're going to say a ball bounces, if I'm going to say, "Tell me something that bounces," and you say a ball, I want you to you know show me, show me what a bounce is. What's a bounce versus a throw? Questions, what do you tell time with? Follow that with, well, where's the clock in this room? What time is it now? Maybe the child doesn't know how to tell time, but knows that you look at a clock. What do you brush your teeth with? Hand the student a toothbrush. Hey, can you brush, show me brushing your teeth. Brush Woody's teeth. Show me combing, show me combing versus show me brushing. After asking, what's a frog say? Ask the child, well, let's hop like a frog. Where's a frog live? The question is, show me what do you cut with? Follow that with show me cutting, show me writing. What do you cut with? What do you write on? You, you want to start mixing those things. Now, a lot of those are going to have to be taught, but you want to be able to use it. What do you talk on? Um, hand the student the phone, well, let's talk. Show me talking. Sometimes it's just a matter of going just one step further. It's just, if anything, just get away from just teaching that label. Here's the phone. Here's what you talk on. This is a picture of a phone, which none of them look like phones anymore. Um, <laughs> and I'm not even sure you talk on phones anymore. You do all this other stuff that I'm lost in. Um, where you play games on. Uh, if the trial has to do with pouring, uh, you pour juice. Uh, I wanna, well, one thing I want to make sure that we're able to separate the noun from the verb, pouring juice, or else this is a bottle of, this is a glass of juice. And say, what is this? Pouring juice. No, this is juice. Oh, by the way, this is this clicker is my all purpose. Sometimes it's a cow, sometimes it's a ball. In this case, it's juice. This is pouring, this is juice. This is bouncing, this is a ball. This is not bouncing ball. So, very careful. You want to, you want to. You might teach those and, and mix them. So um, I didn't quite, this example's not quite complete. I've got like pouring rice, pouring juice, pouring sand, pouring cereal, but also mixed with you know, pouring rice, stirring juice, stirring sand, pouring cereal, um, both as a listener and as, as uh, expressive as, as a tag. Show me stirring sand. All right, good. What am I doing now? Oh, pouring juice. Now what am I doing? Stirring rice. Mixing those, those up like that. Um, so again, these aren't really natural environment trials, but they're closer to, to functional and sharing their responses out rote. Uh, again, which is the main reason we want to conduct natural environment training. <coughs> You can also, I like to get away from the table. Um, it, you know, kids are 
all over the place, they like to be all over the place. So sometimes you don't have to sit at the table for a long period of time and then go into this next room and, and do that for a long period of time. Generally, in, in many cases, in some cases you do, and, and this depends. You know, all, everything I'm saying depends on the, on the kid to some extent because if you're in school, you, that's what school is like. You're going you're to have to learn how to sit in a classroom until the bell rings or until that, until somebody says you can go. You're going to then have to go, you go to gym class and you, you know, have to, so that can be, that can be important too. You have to, you have to teach that. But in, in the earlier stages when you're just trying to teach some of the, some of this earlier stuff, um, you know, I like to have, you, you're, you're sitting at the table, I like to think, I like to think of the whole world or, you, or you, at least your whole environment is a teaching situation. Here's the table. Now I've got my teaching materials here, but I might ask you to get up and do something away from the table and, and come, come right back. If you don't come back, then that's another problem that we have to solve. Um, so again, I would say, well, don't do that with this. First, teach him to come back after you say, hey, can you go shut the window? Go, you know, you say, all right, go look out the window um, and see, uh, count, the, count the, the, the trees outside. It doesn't come back, then we put that in the program. All right, go somewhere and come back. So some of these examples. Uh, this is a sink. You know what is this? It's a sink. Well, hey, can you go 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 put this with the sink in the bathroom? Go go show me the sink in the bathroom. Um, Tapping uh, or labeling uh, actions on a on a figure. Uh, this is this is uh, Woody and Woody's jumping, Woody's dancing, Woody's sitting. Well, you show me. You show me jumping, dancing, sitting. What am I doing, jumping, dancing, sitting? Um, you can always tie in social stuff. And again, that's another presentation. But with just about any of this, um, think of how, how you know, a simple thing like this almost every trial. Well, well, go show Janice Woody how Woody can dance, or show me Woody dancing. Oh, where's Woody? I don't have Woody. You know what? Uh, Mary Ann has Woody. And, and in fact, of course, that might be where you need to teach. Because a, a lot of times it sounds easy. So what do you say? Well, Mary Ann has Woody. Okay. So you, that's an opportunity to teach if the child really wants to show you Woody dancing. Um, have the student a picture of a computer, ask her to find the real one, um, find an airplane, wait, hey, let's pretend to be an airplane, let's fly. Hey, let's look out the window. Do you see any airplanes? Um, can you tell me, uh, let's talk about, we can talk about wings, we can talk about things that fly that are airplanes, uh, we can talk about other vehicles, you know, what, how, how you get places. Uh, do rocks float? Um, go to the sink and demonstrate. Let's talk about What's, what's what? Do you think this will float? What do you think? Think this will float? Um, let's try it. Uh, anyway, life is a science experiment. Um, I'm going to I've kind of covered this. I'm going to skip some of this in here. To. I already hit like like what I call lame natural environment is when you're going and using the natural environment to do your teaching. You're doing your teaching on the playground, and, and that's okay if you want to use a swing as a reinforcer. But I, what I'm saying is don't call that. You know, if I say, you know what, let's try to get 50 percent of your training from this kid out in the natural environment, and I'm not talking about bringing a box of pictures out to the to the swing. Um, now, if you're working, if you, you can call that training something else, but that's not natural environment. So now, as we start getting into more, there's talking about your environment or learning things about your environment, about the room or about the setting that you're in. Um, you know, if you're in the playground you're gonna, or, or outside, you're going to want to be able to you know, receptively identify or go to these places or, or label them. Um, 
and th those are good. Those are necessary, but not quite the ultimate level that we want. So that's something. Yes, we have to do that. I want, I want you to be able to, you know, if, 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 if you can show me a tree, and the picture card, and a, and a basketball, and a basketball goal, and, and the car, and the road, and all of that, I want to make sure you can do that out in the, uh, out in the playground, out where we're, gonna, where we're going to use it. But that's still not quite the ultimate. Um, yeah, grass, rock, swing, basketball. That's still pretty much teaching for right now. Now, conducting, this is the, the, the best kind, conducting trials in the natural environment that are specific to the activity. Okay? Uh, these are the best situations um, to, uh, to create language. Trials that consist of what the student is doing right now. And here's where I we like to call these uh, themes, for example. Um, a train set. So if a, if a kid is playing with a train, think about what are the things that you can do with the train? And, and here's, while a child is, is playing with the train, can we do some training, some, some teaching? Versus the notion of, you work for me for 20 minutes, now you go play. You, know, you go play and, and do whatever you want and play with those trains. It's like, eh, I'd rather, for, for one, two, two issues with that. One is, is you're kind of using escape for a reinforcer. I'll work for you, and then my reinforcer comes over here. You want to try to turn that around. I'd rather have the reinforcer. <coughs> you need me for the reinforcer. Um, at, at one level. Again, as kids get older and more skilled and in more 